or Rogers TV. Hi, and welcome to Politically Speaking. I'm David Sherman. My guest is Alex Ruff, MP for Bruce Gray Owen Sound. And uh, Alex is very busy. He's on the run. And we really appreciate you taking the time today to, to have a conversation with us. Oh, hey, David. Thanks for having me once again. Uh, obviously, it's the last week here with the house sitting before the Christmas break. And rumors are we might be here for a while yet uh, to the end of the week. It could be uh, it could be a late Friday night as there's a number of uh, pieces of legislation uh, that uh, may need to get through. So uh, it's been an interesting week to, so far. Well, I was looking at the House of Commons website this, this morning in preparation for our conversation. And I have to say the House of Commons website is actually very superb in, in telling you exactly what the status of legislation is, where, what it is, where its purpose, what its purpose is, and the text. So uh, it, was, uh, it was good to follow. But yes, I see it's already marked into Friday. <laughs> Uh, it's normally marked a couple weeks or sometimes in advance. Uh, normally, we'll get a heads up. It's always subject to change. Um, but it is a great website. In fact, I encourage any of the listeners or viewers out there that if they're ever looking for things, a lot of the time I, I will direct them to the uh, House of Commons website, uh, our commons, O U R commons.ca. They can just search under my name. They can search any member of parliament. They can search the Hansard or the debates. and anything they can search the votes it's a great it's a really well put together site in my in my viewpoint to uh, get information they can even watch the videos go back and watch the actual debate in the house and the majority of committee meetings too david are you still there you seem to be frozen Now, I should let you know, Alex, I'm having a little technical problem. As you were speaking, I dropped out twice. So if we drop out, just keep talking, which for a politician should not be a problem. <laughs> no well, David, you've cut out again. So I guess I'll take this opportunity to talk to uh, the viewers uh, if this is still uh, uh, as, until you can get back on the call. Uh, yeah, it's been an interesting week. Obviously, Parliament's only been back now uh, almost a month, and uh, we're trying to get a bunch of things done. I mean, as I've expressed before, it was a little disappointing that it took so long for the House to get recalled. Uh, and now we're actually panicking a little bit. The, the Liberal government's trying to uh, get a lot of things through uh, in this short time frame. Uh, one aspect in particular that I found a little frustrating this week, this week alone, I've already had three Human committee meetings, uh, the, the the committee that I'm sitting on with, uh, and um, we've already had three of them uh, in the span of really 24, 48 hours, uh, in, in particular to get Bill yes. C3 through the House. And so it's been uh, a little frustrating that uh, no heads up, no, not a lot of warning, and uh, amendments that uh, we wanted to propose. We, in fact, have met yesterday morning, had the, the minister there and the officials. The meeting ended at one o'clock or actually it was almost 1.30. And uh, we had an hour, an hour and a half to get any amendments we wanted to bring in and then try to debate them at the clause by clause review yesterday afternoon at 3.30. Uh, of course, it was delayed because we put a lot of strain and pressure on the uh, legal drafters, the um, translation services, et cetera, for everything to be presented in both official languages. So. Uh, I did express, I don't think the committee meetings uh, minutes are yet available. Uh, it normally takes the committee stuff to show up on, on the House of Commons website a couple days. Uh, but once that stuff's up there, people can see. And I mean, I even raised that as a concern once we were done. Okay. Um, just to let you know, we are having a few technical difficulties, but we're working, we're working on it, okay? Um, I was going to ask you, what committee are you on? at this point you, you referred to it a moment ago but what is the the formal title do you know or you have yeah, you, well, a long I, I should know i mean i'm kind of sitting on potentially upwards of uh three committees uh two of them are sort of i guess um 
well, one's Afghanistan, and I'm not officially sitting on it. It's a special committee that I was very uh, glad to see us uh, push through. Uh, the one that I'm officially on is the Yuma Committee, the Human Resources, Skills, and Social Development and the Status of Persons with Disabilities. And there's potentially one other committee I may get involved with, so uh, we'll, we'll see how that all plays out here in the uh, uh, coming days and weeks. Uh, but my schedule, yeah, it's a, it's been a little packed uh, with committee meetings. I had Yuma on Monday, uh, Afghanistan Monday night, and then Yuma twice yesterday. And so I was supposed to be giving a speech on C5, which I'm going to give this afternoon, providing nothing happens in the House of Commons uh, during a following question period that delays that. Uh, but I was supposed to give it Monday, supposed to give it yesterday, and now uh, hopefully I'll be able to deliver it today. Well, it's it's interesting because you're you were deputy whip, and you uh, you did you you did not move into the the, the same position with the um, with the election. So, but you're doing more committee work. It sounds like. Yeah, you know that's exactly the leadership team normally doesn't sit on uh, on committees. I was on the joint interparliamentary uh, council, which uh, sort of manages the uh, all the trip. All the different interparliamentary groups or associations that meet and sort of it's a, it's a it's an important committee to sort of set the ground rules or council i should say to set the ground rules around sort of interparliamentary travel and funding etc which obviously this past year or two uh has been significantly uh with strained or restrained i should say uh and and therefore uh you know a little bit there but there's some actual fundamental uh uh, review going on there. So in the end, uh, the, my, my replacement on that uh, council uh, is going to be busy as well. So just some of that stuff happens behind the scene in camera doesn't happen in the public uh, viewpoint. But uh, look, uh, lots busy, just some of the stuff in committee work, yeah, is more is more visible, I guess, to the public. But I'd remind uh, viewers, I was actually in a lot of committees, uh, even last session, uh, I almost was at every defense committee. I just wasn't a formal member of that of those committees. So it's 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 busy, but we're all a big team. People are constantly subbing in and filling in at different committees at different times. As I said, normally a committee will meet twice a week, some only once a week. Uh, again, a little shocking. I met three times in in two days <laughs> on one committee alone. But again, that goes back to my earlier comment that uh, we had this. Uh, election so urgent to have and then it took uh, over two months to get the house back into in, in parliament recalled and then all of a sudden oh geez we got to get this uh, these bills passed uh, immediately so hopefully uh, we'll see how that all plays out here in the coming days and that's why I, I sort of hinted we may we may be here right through normally the house sometimes breaks at, at on the Wednesday before Christmas uh, recess but we'll see how that plays out I have a feeling we're going to be here late Friday you said that you were giving a speech on C5, and the C the C5 the number is a um, simply a, a number on the order paper for the House of Commons, and each each bill has a number, um, and uh, C5 is the one that which amends the Criminal Code regarding I think regarding mandatory sentencing, if I'm not mistaken, and also um, uh, makes some changes to the Controlled Drugs and Substances Act, which re I think reduces the, or at least allows a diversion program to be entered into for, uh, I'm presuming, um, appropriate uh, convictions. Is that right? Yeah, no, you've nailed that with better language than I likely use uh, for <laughs> when I'm communicating it, it or more official terms. Uh, yeah, bottom line is sort of a, a soft on gun crime bill, um, and exactly what uh, they've brought forth here, it, it, and for your traffickers, kidnapping, extortion, a lot of serious crimes. So they're trying to repeal um, mandatory minimums that were brought in by actually uh, Pierre Elliott Trudeau when he was the prime minister and John Chrétien. So that's how old some of these mandatory minimums go back. And they're really focused on those uh, trafficking of illegal firearms, committing a crime with a, an illegal firearm, um, the drugs and trafficking, uh, some of the most deadly uh, drugs that are on the street, i.e. carfentanil, meth, uh, meth, and, uh, meth, crystal meth, uh, coke, heroin, cocaine. Uh, let's let's lower the, the the mandatory minimums or get rid of them. Repeal those mandatory minimums is what this bill is trying to do. And then, as you hinted at some of the others, is actually bring in a provision that would allow uh, somebody that's involved with human trafficking um, 
to actually serve house arrest versus jail time. So it's really, uh, you know, and I'm not taking a, a away from the independence of our judiciary and the ability for our, our incredible judges to make good decisions on 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 the necessary sentencing uh, needed for these criminals. But this isn't, uh, you know, it sometimes gets out there and, and some of the media, or the, at least the way the Liberals have been sort of talking to this bill, that it's about, uh, you know, dealing with, those people that are are you know down and out that are dealing with uh, drug addiction drug addiction issues and et cetera. This isn't about simple possession. There is no mandatory minimum for simple possession. This is for the traffickers, the drug traffickers, the illegal firearms people that are committing violent crimes with firearms, uh, and as I said, human traffickers. That's what this bill is actually reducing uh, the thing uh, the appeal for. And it's not about those. Uh, you know, people that are, uh, you know, unfairly represented in our, in our uh, prison system either, because they're not mentioned once in the whole bill. So there's a little bit of, I don't even understand the, the, the tactics behind doing this, uh, as I've been quite critical in the past, in the last parliament, when they brought forth bill C, uh, well, the order in council, uh, in particular against uh, legal firearms owners. Uh, you know, they're going after legal firearms owners, yet they're letting criminal, violent criminals, uh, serious criminals and repeat offenders uh, they're trying to make uh, life easier to put them back on the street. And that's the last thing as a father of an eight-year-old daughter um, I want to be dealing with. If somebody commits a serious crime that impacts our most vulnerable in this society or that is helping aid to the opioid crisis that we have in this country by, uh, you know, increasing trafficking um, and, and distribution of hard drugs, I don't understand why you'd want to uh, limit the amount of time that these individuals uh, need to need to serve in, in our prison system if found guilty. So I think there's ways that they could have brought this forward with uh, even you know tweaking the extenuating circumstances and different ways to allow judges to have even more flexibility. Uh, but the, to be frank on this, this is uh, I don't understand why they're doing this bill. Uh, I'll be speaking to it here shortly in the House of Commons, uh, and I really try to, and, and I've spoken to this before, and I mean, I've lately been more partisan in, during our interview today, David, than I normally am. Uh, I try to be nonpartisan. I try to look at the pros and the like, the, the good parts of any piece of legislation, what we should be supporting, uh, and what they need to improve upon. And I am really struggling. There's not a single thing in this bill that I think, I, I, I'm going to be fascinated who can support it, but I'm sure uh, the, the government uh, party members will, uh, and uh, we'll see if the other two opposition parties uh, feel as, as strongly against uh, the bill as I do. I know there's aspects of it that they are they supportive, but listening to the speeches over the couple of days of debate, it, they, they definitely feel that it doesn't make a lot of sense either. So we'll see how it all plays out when it eventually comes to a vote. And hopefully, uh, when it gets to committee, because I'm confident, well, you never know, it could get defeated at second reading and, and never go to committee, but I doubt that's the case. Most, uh, one of, they'll find a, a partner to at least get it to committee uh, to work on the amendments, and hopefully then we can, you know, make it make sense of it. But in reality, I don't know if this bill is salvageable at all. Well, so did we just hear your speech? No. <laughs> no, I mean, I, I mean, I, I'm going to try to speak from the heart, David. You're likely not uh, far off. Uh, I do have to speak for 10 minutes. Um, and it, this is a bill, and I think this is, uh, you know, for any politician, uh, and I think it, it impacts more. I, I try, I'm trying not to write speeches. Uh, you know, I have staff that help do the research and, and can help me. Sometimes you do if you don't, uh, if it's specific, you don't want to make names wrong. Uh, there's parts that you, you need to refer to. I will have during my formal speech the exact, uh, you know, I have them here in, in my office, the specific criminal code uh, changes that they're making the, in, in, to deal with. But I think it comes across a lot better to Canadians and to voters and to other members of parliament when you, you understand that you understand the material or that you can convey that. And at the same time, you're speaking from your heart and it's something that you care about deeply. So look, we're never going to have complete agreement. That's the beauty of living in a democracy. And that's what we're here for is to debate legislation and to try to make it better. Whether or not we agree 100% in the House, I, there's very there's a few bills that get through unanimously, but it doesn't happen a lot. And uh, it, when it does happen, it's a, it's a good thing um, if we can do that and come to that agreement. But ultimately, our job, especially uh, the, the official loyal opposition, 
is to actually oppose everything and challenge everything to make sure it's the best bill possible. It doesn't mean that we disagree with the full intent or aspects of it, but we want to make sure it's the best bill possible before it becomes law. Well, it'll be interesting to watch because as as uh, your speech will probably be on your member's website or on the uh, yes on the on the your, the House of Commons website in due course, so we can we can watch it ourselves and uh, and see what you what you've said in the in the House. It's um, it's always uh, quite interesting to to watch that. And I should also add that that particular bill is very technical. If you happen to go to the House of Commons website and look at the bill, it's it's fairly technical. And it's, I won't say it's easy to understand, but it's, it's, a te- it's a technical bill because it refers to different acts and it talks about removing and adding and so on and so forth. But uh, the, the majority of the bills themselves, David, are like that all the time. Like I yes. just went through the clause by clause review of Bill C3, which is actually very short. Um, mm-hmm. And we tried to make some amendments. Uh, you know, we tried to, I brought it up during the initial uh, when we had witness statements or which were the, the minister in front to say, look, got this. I mean, I'm a fully supportive of the idea that we shouldn't, uh, that, you know, people that want to protest uh, peacefully, 100% behind that. In fact, I talked about that. I, I will always stand up for free speech in this country and the ability for Canadians to express uh, their concerns. Uh, we definitely shouldn't be interfering with our, our unions and our, our, our protesters and their ability, you know, through collective bargaining or through the tools that they have there. Uh, but we definitely have to stop uh, people that are interfering with our health workers' ability to get into hospitals and do their jobs. So that aspect, but we actually tried to expand. I said, look, this makes perfect sense, but why narrow it just to health workers? Uh, let's expand it to critical uh, services, essential services right across the country, uh, so that it's not just those people, because it should be no different when we have people, say, working at Bruce Power, uh, that if they were getting protests, that's going to potentially risk our our power supply in in Ontario, um, and you know those people shouldn't be uh, you shouldn't you should be appropriately charged and stopped if you're going to interfere with those ability of essential workers to get to their job. Uh, unfortunately, uh, didn't get the support um, in, in the uh, at, at committee in order to get that uh, that amendment through. But anyway, long story to say that when you look at the, every bill, they are quite technical in nature. And that's C three that you were talking about, which is uh, one of the, the the bills that is on the on the um, uh, the the order paper, which is to amend the criminal code and the Canada Labor Code, as you said, to um, stop the intimidation of healthcare professionals or anyone who has an appropriate access to to a healthcare um, or healthcare service. And uh, it's you're right; it's very simple. I'm actually looking at the the text right now, and it's it's three paragraphs. <laughs> and but the other. Yeah, yeah, there's two parts of that bill, though. The second part of that yes. bill is tied to 10 days of sick leave. And, and that was one of our criticisms of the bill, because th- that's the part they really wanted to rush through. And why what they called us was the labor portions of the 10 days of sick leave uh, for federally uh, regulated sectors. And that part of it, um, you know, again, no issues. Understand their, their concern there, especially with the pandemic and, and people... Uh, not being able to go to work uh, when they when they do catch the virus, and uh, so therefore making sure that they have that appropriate coverage. However, um, why they mixed that with protests uh, in, in changing the criminal code didn't make a lot of sense, and that was one of our recommendations. Just split these bills. We can deal with the part that's uh, immediate and concerning, get it through the House as quickly as possible. It's, it speeds up the whole process greatly. And deal with the others and it's even kind of relevant if you look at that bill you go to the uh, clause 8 the last part of that bill you'll see that the fact of the matter is the changes to the criminal code uh, will come into effect upon uh, royal assent uh, 30 days after royal assent is given whereas the, the very final paragraph talks about the labor changes and they'll, they'll come into effect as soon as the order and council is met so as soon as it receives royal assent then the uh, cabinet meets and they can give an order in council from uh, the Liberal cabinet that would then make it effective immediately. So they're not even tied to the same coming into effect date. So again, it's the techni- technicalities of it, but it's just one of those points where why wouldn't you just split this bill, get them dealt with quite quickly and making sure, you know, and I think it would have offered myself and, and other colleagues, other MPs, the opportunity to say, hey, look, Actually, you got a good idea here with this idea to protect our healthcare workers 
uh, ability to do the job and, and why don't we expand that but when you only have an hour and a half's notice to try to get an amendment convince a bunch of committee meet a member and it wasn't even that much time because we it came up during the testimony uh, when the minister was in front of the committee and then literally it ended we're off to question period we're trying to get these amendments drafted into both bilingual or into both official languages and then we're meeting and literally going by clause by clause so when it's getting introduced to committee you're trying to convince people in two minutes and that's not the way to appropriate make legislation better so again i'm not a fan of rushing anything through the house of commons uh, especially those parts of uh, legislation that should have greater consideration you you make a point i think it's a valid one about uh, the bundling of um legislation at the same time the government doesn't matter which stripe over the last 20 years has used the idea of an omnibus bill which bundles a bunch of issues together some of them related some of them not and uh i remember um that the opposition was all was forever saying hey, just a minute <laughs> Let, let's split this omnibus bill or, or carve this out of the omnibus bill so just goes to show that the same idea is in play but uh, you know it, it just depends on whose side you're on david 100 percent agree this was one of the biggest criticisms by the uh the liberals when they were in opposition against former prime minister harper i mean obviously uh before my time i had i wasn't involved uh, obviously, I was serving whatever color government uh, was in power at the time, being in the Canadian Armed Forces. However, the, the hypocrisy of it is kind of uh, you know interesting because you actually have the current Liberal government ran to get elected in 2015 on not doing any omnibus bills, and that and that's a quote. I mean, not exactly word for word; it's paraphrasing uh, Prime Minister Trudeau. Uh, but that's what he ran on in 2015 that they were not going to do this if they formed government. And so it, that's the part I find frustrating. I, I look, I understand the political uh, reasons why different parties would do this, um, but I don't think you should be the party that says you're not going to do it and then do it. That's that's the issue I have with any party. It doesn't matter what color they are or who they represent. Uh, it's the fact of the matter is, don't say you're going to do one thing and then do something else. The interesting thing is that this is this is actually a strategy that is used in the American system. Uh, where they get they they bundle these bills, uh, you know, and, and everybody gets their kick at the can. And hey, uh, <laughs> maybe I'm not critiquing the value and the, and the political calculus that goes into this, David, at all. I'm not crit criticizing that at all. <laughs> I fully understand the tactical and the political reasoning uh, rationale why this happens and why different parties and different governments and different countries would use this tool. Um, but my point is, don't say you're not going to use it and then use it. Just of course. be honest. Be honest with Canadians. Sure, sure. Now I want to go back to um, actually. So you you had referred to it earlier as uh, a unanimous uh, vote on a bill, and we did actually have that when the House um, after the speech from the throne, and that was on C four which was a bill to amend the criminal code to prohibit conversion therapy. And this is a bill that's got quite a track record in the in the house because it's come to it went it, it didn't it 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 failed to be um, um to pass the senate I believe um before we before we had the election uh, but it's been, it's come up two or three times and and reached different levels of approval but this time my golly the 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 opposition surprised everyone by saying yeah we agree <laughs> well, look, Bill C-4, which was Bill C-6 uh, in the last second session of last parliament, and uh, I think Bill C-8 in the first session of last parliament, and it's not the first time uh, that it was brought forward. I think it was brought forward even as a private member's bill in a previous parliament uh, or a version of it. Um, the problem with it, and, and again, my track record is there, I voted for Bill C-6 despite my reservations uh, with it because uh, very poorly defined, and, and, and I think you know my biggest criticism of the bill and Bill C4, uh, no differently. It's not a well-written bill. It's purposely written to divide Canadians. Uh, the definition is not clear in it. Uh, but that being said, we basically had a lengthy debate on this in the House of Commons, uh, and so we agreed uh, to you know let it pass unanimously uh, through the House to get the Senate. Where they can make their decision on what else they needed to uh, do or not do uh, 
uh, to uh, to improve upon it or not. And ultimately, senators decided that it just, you know what, it, it needs to go through. Uh, to be frank, it doesn't change anything really here for constituents of Bruce Gray Owen Sound. Ontario has had a law, and we ran in the last election to ban conversion therapy. We just would have done it in a much clearer way that wouldn't have divided Canadians in our viewpoint. Um, but the b bottom line, it's been against the law since 2015 uh, here in Ontario. And so ultimately, it wasn't going to change one way or another. The constituents, it, again, I, I, it was tough. It was tough to make that decision uh, to... Uh, you know, vote for it, vote, vote against it. Uh, again, I think I can logically, rationally, you know, uh, rationalize whatever way I voted on it, but ultimately it has hurt. There has been uh, terrible practices uh, in, in this country uh, against our LGBTQ2 plus community. And, and therefore, uh, you know, we needed to make that uh, crystal clear that this is no longer accepted. So. Uh, the bill did pass, uh, you know, and I honestly think it's not uh, it's not ideal the, the way the bill is written, but ultimately it did go through, and uh, now we can get that behind us and concentrate on what else needs to be get it. Because the, the majority of things that I'm hearing from uh, constituents on a daily basis, uh, you know, over the last couple months is is concerned about the cost of living, the inflation, groceries, as you, you see a number of the uh, economic uh, or economists coming out and the different people with the inflation uh, increase with the cost of living that it's going to cost Canadians a thousand dollars more between their groceries their heating their gas next year alone uh, and that's tough especially on those people that are struggling uh, already and so those are the big concerns that I'm hearing about you know the labor shortage is the biggest thing I heard in the election and that hasn't gone away that's just as bad and getting worse so there's some real issues that we really need to focus on that's impacting every Canadian right across this great country and that I'm hearing about daily from the constituents. So those are the things that I really need to think we need to be focused on uh, versus debating how well you know written a certain bill is or not and getting into the technicalities of something that uh, ultimately has been decided and voted on or that we voted on in the past and so therefore we decided let's not waste any more time on this let's get it through the house and start focusing on those things that are truly important to most canadians now the bank of canada has received its letter of direction for the next five years that happened this week um and uh it, it did did seem to say to the to the government did seem to say to the bank of canada uh keep on your target um uh, but yeah, fight in, there, there seem to be at least a bone toss to the, to people who are concerned about inflation. No, it was good. I mean, it was late coming, but uh, ultimately that uh, direction to ma maintain the focus on keeping our inflation rate at 2% is key. We're obviously not there. I don't think the policies that the government's brought forward, uh, you know, again, there, there's been a lot of money printed in the last year and a bit, and, and unfortunately, you know, it, it targets those Canadians that are most struggling the most, uh, the, those well-off, rich, uh, very wealthy Canadians, they're the ones that are, they're the only ones benefiting from inflation going up. But for those people that can't afford, don't own a home, that are renting, that are just making, you know, barely getting by, they're the ones impacted the most uh, by inflation. And, and I really think that the government needs to focus zero, mentioned once in the in the throne speech, not, uh, not really, no real, uh, addressed or measures to address it in, in yesterday's fiscal update. Again, the update's supposed to be a snapshot. We'll see if there's any actual uh, targeted ways to focus on that uh, moving forward. And, uh, but yeah, it's just, I'm glad to see that Bank of, uh, you know, that that direction has been given to the Bank of Canada to, to keep their efforts focused on keeping inflation at 2%. All right, Alex, we're going to take a quick break and come back and have a little con more conversation because well, there's always more to talk about. I'm David Shearman. This is Politically Speaking. We'll be right back. This program is brought to you by Ignite TV. Now you're in command. Visit rogers.com for more details. Welcome to the traditional, ancestral, unceded territory of the Stalo people. The Stalo are people of the river. 
I'm so thankful for the courage and resiliency of our ancestors who lived on this land since time immemorial. Each of us have gifts from the Creator, and our Creator has a plan and purpose to be fulfilled in our territory. As we embrace our traditional teachings, we can lead the next generation into the fullness of what our Creator designed. Our shared history reveals a broken relationship, but as all Canadians commit to hear truth, acknowledge injustice, we can learn to walk in our traditional way, let's amount, with a good heart and a good mind. Then all of our lives will be enriched. Kwasai. Focus better. Partner better. Sleep better. Breathe better. Love better. Work better. Friend better. Unwind better. Everything gets better when you get active. The opinions expressed in the following programs are those of the participants and do not necessarily reflect those of Rogers nor Rogers TV. Hi, and welcome back to Politically Speaking. I'm David Shearman. My guest is Alex Roth. MP for Bruce Gray, Owen Sound. And we're, we're kind of moving this forward because Alex has to get to the House of Commons. He's got a, an important date <laughs> and a speech. <laughs> Alex, welcome back. Always good to have you. Well, thanks again, David. Now, we were talking about legislation, um, and it's really good to hear your perspective on the various bills that are that are happening because I think that it it we hear them referred to by their number by their number on the order paper or they, the the general subject matter but there's always a lot more to it than than uh, than just uh, the words and what we may even may even see on the on the evening news. I wanted to go to uh, Bill C two which is the government's resp uh, further, um, dare I say it, shuffling of programs um, around COVID. What's your comment on, on that particular bill? Is that, is that a, first of all, is that a, uh, that's a financial bill, is it? So it'll be yeah. a, con it's a con potentially a confidence motion. Um, I don't think it's a confidence motion. That's a great question. It's never been discussed that way. Um, in the House, uh, indications are it's going to get support. There's a good chance we're going to vote against, even though we support uh, chunks of it. Uh, we did put, I, I believe, four conditions on what we wanted to see. Some of that was tied to getting the all the committees back up and, and running, uh, because, again, it didn't make sense that we're not going to uh, only pick and choose which committees got to reform, because they could have dragged that out. And at one point, we didn't think any of the committees would have been back other than you know, obviously, they wanted the uh, Finance Committee back because they needed it to pass Bill C-2, and they needed Yuma back to pass C-3. So they gave us that condition, um, just whether or not um, they're going to do uh, the rest of our conditions that we wanted to see, which included actually, I think, splitting um, part of the bill. I'm just trying to dig this up as we're talking here, David, just to make sure I got all the facts, because I, unfortunately, I don't have those memorized. I didn't uh, speak to Bill C-2, so it's one of those ones where um, if you don't speak to it, you, you don't always have uh, all, all the facts right at your fingertips. So let me just, um, yeah, I don't know. We'll see if we can find it here, but uh, ultimately um, we'll, we'll see how it goes. And, and whether it's a confidence motion or not, well, again, it's up to the Liberal government to find a dance partner uh, in order to get their support for it. Yes, and, and so it's, a, it's a good way of phrasing it, a dance partner. And um, there are obviously um, conversations which are ongoing um, behind the scenes, so to speak, between um, the the government of the day and uh, and either the uh, bloc or the NDP, and uh, sometimes the conservatives, just to see test the waters to see where things are. But um, it, it's uh, it's a pretty close um, situation because uh, you can, uh, as long as the government has a partner, it, it should be okay. It should be able to get its legislative agenda passed. Yeah, no, and, and here's here's the conditions. I just found them, David. Uh, that the bill go through the normal committee process, i.e. that the Finance Committee must uh, immediately resume work and do a full study of the bill. The other thing that the House provide the necessary funding and, and mandate 
for an urgent independent investigation of FinTrack's report of organized crime uh, profiting from the pandemic programs. I think you would have saw, or and the listeners would have saw in the, in, in the national media where there's some cases of, I think upwards of $100,000 has gone to gangs of uh, some of the pandemic programs served, I think in particular, the, the, the organized crime was able to uh, actually get $100,000 out of the government to fund their criminal activities. So we want that independent investigation. I think that's actually one of the holdups that there's, for whatever reason, not interested in supporting. Um, as well, we want to include new measures to avoid giving um, uh, benefits to those people that are more than capable of going back to work. Their businesses are doing, whereas we talked about earlier, the labor shortage. Uh, and, a, and, a, and another thing is just making sure that there's measures in there to stop that criminal activity uh, and making sure fraud's not occurring. So we're just trying to hold the you know, introduce some accountability uh, to the to to the bill to make sure that there's money, not more money going out that's that's going out to uh, criminals, fraudsters, and organized crime. So that's that's the key thing that we are doing that in general. Uh, otherwise, so we'll see. I haven't had an update on um, where it sits with respect to. Um, the committee work, I know the, the finance committee had gone through. I don't know if they're completely done or not, because as I said, I've been, the last two days have been completely chaotic uh, and uh, very little time outside of the committee rooms. So it hasn't, I haven't had time to get up to speed on those other meetings that are going on. Uh, so it'll be interesting to see, but I, I'm assuming uh, we'll get an update on that in the very near future, uh, because I'm anticipating uh, that's the key thing that's going to keep us here uh, over the next couple of days is, is seeing Bill C-2 um, getting passed through the House, so one way or another. So we'll see how that all plays out. Yeah, I think your comment about um, funding of COVID-19 program funding uh, going askew is is a is a very trenchant to what to the situation. But the same thing happened in Ontario. Uh, the Auditor General came in and said, "Excuse me, uh, there were companies that didn't qualify that got money." So and those that's on the legal side but we don't what we don't know is what other things the auditor general here in the province will uh will come up with um i, I think the more important thing is what will be what will get recovered great questions david i mean i'm not an auditor uh, we'll we'll see how it all plays out here and again that's why we wanted the independence uh, of of this being done through fintrack and the organization that has that capability to do the independent research and enough investigation into determining where the money flowed to uh, that's not up to the politicians obviously and uh, all, you know and, and it's important because ultimately that's what contributes to not only inflation in this country uh, but making a, 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 you know our national deficit and debt, sorry, uh, you know, continue to grow and, and make it uh, more and more expensive. I just read, I think this morning, 24.6 billion. If I got that number, it might be off by, you know, a, a billion or two the wrong way or the right way, hopefully. Uh, but I just saw that in an article that just to pay the interest on our national debt this year alone is $24.6 billion. Uh, just I can't even fathom that. That's more money than the whole Canadian Armed Forces budget is uh, that we're paying on interest on our debt alone. Well, that would buy one very, very, very rich, large, and expensive house. You know, affordable housing is a big thing. I don't know of any house worth about $24 billion yet, David, but uh, maybe you live in a nicer house than I. <laughs> I trust you. Trust me. No, I don't. <laughs> I don't, which leads me to the question. Um, I, I was reading a, an article, um, an interview with a former head of the Canadian Mortgage and Housing Corporation, CMHC, and one of the things that I, I found rather startling was that, that he said in his experience the government doesn't have, has a lot of, has tools but they're blunt tools to affect the housing market. And that, that, that some of the tools which people say will, will not have the desired result perhaps, but that he was, he was suggesting that the, the real um, engine that will drive a change to our housing situation is going to be private builders. It comes down to a very simple thing. It's supply and demand, David. We need more supply. There's not enough houses out there, affordable houses in particular, uh, for the market. And so 
until we get that fixed and, and until you get private industry and, and, and those builders, uh, that ability and flexibility, and what complicates this is the fact of the matter is um, it, it crosses all three levels of government. It, there's, there's federal aspects to it, there's provincial aspects, and there's municipal aspects. So we've seen some municipalities, ours included, uh, you know, across Bruce Gray and Sound. I think it was uh, either Gray Highlands maybe that brought forward uh, an idea to change some of their local bylaws to allow building on smaller uh, parcels of land, um, you know, split those lots down a little bit, which again creates another separate issue. I mean, uh, you know, having spent time in Ottawa here, there's the signs uh, going up that says, uh, you know, down with the de-urbanization or I don't know what the right word is, uh, densification or something like that, because there's people that don't want it, it to be consolidated. But the fact of the matter is, if you look at any of our major populous centers around the world uh you know you go up you don't go out and, and it's it's hard for canadians i think to sometimes fathom that because we are so privileged to live in in the in the second largest country in the world uh, geographically uh, we have space it's traditionally uh, not been a factor uh, but when you want to talk about public transit access to services fiber internet etc cetera, etc cetera, uh, it's a lot easier when everybody's closer together and it's the only way to realistically uh, reduce the costs uh, you know for for affordable housing uh, in some ways so it's to increase the supply but at the same time let's work together collaboratively on that and I mean it's one of the things that we ran in, in the last election was saying look I think the federal government owns something like 37,000 buildings uh, if you converted and sold off 15% uh, of those 37,000 buildings uh, and, and targeted over to building affordable housing, I think that would have been one way to at least address it. And the majority of that is where some of the man, it wouldn't help us in Bruce Gray and Sound. I don't think there's a lot of federal buildings uh, sitting vacant here, here in our area, neck of the woods, uh, but definitely where the demand is sometimes the greatest uh, in, in bigger numbers, it, it would have solved that, which then lessens it because you can see that not only, because we have uh, a lot of Canadians, a lot of, people moving into our neck of the woods that are doing it for retirement purposes, uh, et cetera. But some are being forced out because even though it's very expensive, even in locally, uh, it, the, it's it's a lot cheaper than it is to, to buy in Toronto or Milton or Brampton or Mississauga. And so there, as they move out, it's bumping people just further and further sort of north, which again, we want to see growth, but ideally we want to be attracting a lot of uh, workers we got some great i think business opportunities and i think that is and we've talked about this a little bit before i think one of the few positives that will come out of this um, pandemic is this ability to recognize that there's some great places like uh, our area our riding where you can actually have a way nicer quality of life uh, standard of living uh, with a little bit more space a bit more community a bit more sense of family uh, and and still enjoy what you have elsewhere, providing we can get some of those essential services uh, like high-speed internet uh, out to us, because that, that is a critical, I think, uh, obstruction or, or roadblock uh, in, in actually allowing us to, to continue to develop and, and continue to attract young workers uh, that we need, and not just young, but I mean workers in general to help fix some of our labor shortages uh, here throughout our riding. Yes, indeed. I think that uh, although here in Grey Bruce, our, our unemployment rate has now dropped to uh, uh, actually we're, we're in a better shape than we were before COVID. Uh, well, so that's that, my point. Labor shortage, right? This was a problem have, that was coming yeah. before COVID. Now it's even uh, worse. Yeah, yeah. It's a it's a it's it's a kind of a, a very difficult sandwich to find ourselves in as a as a community. So. Uh, Let's hope that all all three levels of government can work together to uh, to make this happen because I know that it is a it's an important issue for for all levels of government. Uh, now, are you aware of any? Has the government tipped its hand or said anything about housing programs that it might be uh, thinking about, or do you know if it's on the government's agenda? Well, I haven't seen anything sort of officially. We brought forth a housing motion last Thursday that unfortunately was defeated. Uh, they did not support it, and uh, we do, we couldn't get the uh, both other opposition parties uh, on board uh, to to get it through. Uh, you know, so again, maybe we should have, you know, coached the language a little bit different. I think that's sometimes the challenge is is when you're trying to draw attention to 
uh, the failures uh, of the current programs and why we need to do things better. But if you're too, sometimes if you're too negative, that, that's not going to help either because then that's not going to get the focus on there. But no, they haven't really, they talk about the first time home uh, buyers incentive. They talk about needing to fix and expand that because I think, again, I, I always weary to use statistics when I don't have them right in front of me. But I, I think the initial plan was something like 100,000 uh, more homes get built through that program alone initially and up to after I think it's been in place now almost three years uh, that they've had it sort of some version of it. And at the last count I heard was 6,000 6, homes for a program that was geared towards uh, 100,000. So it, it's not working. They need to make some necessary key fundamental changes. And But ultimately, uh, in, in this case, I, I still go back to my, my point. It's about supply. Get out of the way. You need to cut some of the red tape. You still need to make sure everything's safe, secure, you know, environmentally uh, friendly, uh, that we're not doing undue, creating other problems. But the bureaucracy that uh, and the red tape that, that we make people jump through uh, at all levels to, to get, a, uh, you know, construction done in this country uh, is ridiculous in my viewpoint. And it's something that uh, everybody should be seized with because if you can't have a house and a lot of the younger people moving forward, uh, I just don't know how they can afford it. And it's going to be a huge challenge. So we need to do something to make it uh, uh, realistic. Uh, and otherwise, as I know, my, one of my colleagues uh, uh, from Carleton has raised countless times in the House of Commons, uh, you know, uh, asking the finance minister about the potential for a housing crisis, housing bubble, and, and acknowledging that we have one. Because if it breaks, full or bursts, I guess, as you say, the the, the bubble, uh, for those communities that are directly impacted, it'll have a, you know, devastating effect uh, on those families and uh, and our communities. I, I think we're going to be okay in Bruce Gray and Sound. We're not a, as uh, hit by some of this uh, cases, but it, it will hit. It will roll over and impact all of us. So. Uh, there's got to be a little bit of foresight and a little bit of true action on these programs to make something happen sooner than later. You mentioned the member from Carleton. Of course, that is Pierre Poilevre, and uh, his, uh, he, is, he is well known for his, um, how shall I say it, his well-spoken tongue <laughs> and been, turn of phrase. <laughs> yes, he's one of the quick, quick on his feet, witty uh, members uh, in the House of Commons. Uh, Mr. Polyev uh, does a really good job. In fact, uh, we, we were even impressed last week where, you know, he coined the phrase just inflation uh, and, or just an inflation. And uh, we even got the prime minister to admit it in the House of Commons during question period last week and, and, and use the, the phrase himself. So he does get under the skin. Uh, that's one of his skill sets uh, of really getting to the point and asking very pointed, simple questions that for whatever reason, uh, some of the ministers uh, in the government doesn't like don't like replying to because he he is very quick on his feet and it's not somebody uh, uh, you care to debate with. Uh, most people don't. Uh, he, he does strike a little bit of a fear, I think, in the uh, in the government ranks. <laughs> well, there's always got to be somebody in the house who, who who is able to make an impression and able to to use language extremely well. I mean, uh, you can go back to the uh, the debates of John Diefenbaker, for example, or, or some of the some of the other um, illustrious members of Parliament. And uh, it's uh, it's quite it's, it's on one hand it's funny, on the other hand it's quite fascinating to see the the um, oratorical skills that are on on display in the in the House of Commons from time from time to time, not always, but from time to time. And speaking of of which, um, you I did see a, a segment of a speech that you gave in the House of Commons. I think it was a, was it a members. Uh, um, speech on the centennial of the election of Agnes McPhail. Yeah, it was uh, what we call a, a SO31, Standing Order 31, which is statements by members. So we got one minute to give a statement, and it was uh, a privilege to recognize on the 100th year anniversary of Agnes being elected as the first female woman member of parliament in, in, in the federal, uh, in the House of Commons. Uh, it wasn't actually the date that she took her seat. It was the date she was elected. And from my understanding, it was the first time in Canada, too, that uh, women were writ large, all women were allowed to vote in a federal election. So something I think true, uh, nice to recognize, especially when Agnes, uh, you know, came from our, our, our neck of the woods. 
Uh, she actually kind of has ties, depending on how you want to look at it, with uh, three of the different municipalities between West Gray, Southgate, uh, and Gray Highlands, uh, because she sort of has from where she lived to where she was sort of representing to where she kind of grew up at different spots uh, and where she worked out of. Um, but uh, ultimately an inspiration and a role model for, I think, so many uh, women in this country for breaking that glass ceiling. And, and not only with that, she was the first uh, well, the first of two elected to the Ontario legislation, first woman to serve at uh, United Na uh, Nations, uh, to re or the League of Nations, I should say, at that time. Uh, so truly an inspirational uh, a Canadian, uh, true groundbreaker. And I'm looking forward to getting a statement on in March on the exact date that she actually uh, first walked into the House officially, uh, because it took, I think, a few months back then uh, apparently, they were just as tardy back then as we were this year uh, in recalling the House of Commons after the election. Well, it is interesting to to look at her career because she also had a very, very significant aspect on reform of the of the correction systems in Canada. Um, there is a story told that that they refused to allow her into the Kingston Penitentiary because they thought it was too hard on a woman. And uh, she abused them, quickly disabused the uh, correctional authorities of, of that um, notion. And uh, her report and the result was that there were changes made. And uh, many of the things which we would call uh, inhuman or torture today uh, were, were banished from the Canadian penitentiary system because of her efforts. Yeah, 100%. I did allude to that and made that uh, comment in my statement as well to the, her leadership uh, in reform in our prison systems. And uh, the other thing she was absolutely essential in, in bringing into Canada was old age pensions. So two key things that, you know, one member of parliament, uh, I can only aspire that in, in, in my time in office that I, I'll be able to influence uh, something on that uh, scale uh, that she was able to do uh, in her short period uh, in the House of Commons as well. So uh, look, she can inspire every single one of us, uh, you know, and uh, and we're glad. Uh, we, I consider ourselves lucky uh, that we have such a rich history and uh, inner writing of somebody like Agnes McPhail. Indeed, and I, I know that the the difference that her work made, uh, because I talked to my own grandparents about it, because uh, one of my um, my aunts, our great aunts, was a uh, civil servant. And she did not have a pension, and she expected to retire with little, and she had to save every penny. But when she retired from the civil service, by that time there was a pension plan. But not only that, she could benefit from the old age pension. And she said she was so pleased to be able to have benefited from that uh, from that change that happened. And there's a whole history. Uh, of those uh, those programs as you look at them and they have made a huge difference in reducing seniors poverty and in uh, changing in improving the quality of life and health there to do now let's look look forward um, I, I know it's it's hard to tell because you're you're kind of at the um, um, behest of the government of, of the day but what do you see happening in the next well, you're off in January, so we're really looking at coming back in February. What do you see happening um, after the break and uh, when, we, when the House comes back in February? Um, I think you'll see all committees obviously back up and running, and you know, so that'll help shape certain things uh, because the committees can help, uh, you know, they, they control their own agenda, uh, the committee members, unless they have specific bills that they, you know, that the House has passed to them or direction that's come from the House. Uh, from the chamber itself to to address, so that's one thing that I think will will make a difference. I'm, I don't know. I'm somewhat optimistic and cynical. I'm just glad to see our Afghanistan motion get through and get that committee formed. And I'm just not. I'm somewhat cynical whether or not because ideally they'd be meeting over the Christmas break, in my viewpoint, because it's all about uh, not only figuring out what went right and what went wrong, but. Um, what immediate measures and support measures need to be taken into effect to help those Afghans that are that are right now still stuck 
in Afghanistan or surrounding countries that uh, you know are struggling to survive and are, that are in, in a lot of cases being actively hunted by the Taliban. So that's something that uh, to me needs to be a priority. Uh, as for legislation, you're 100% correct. The the government's been keeping its cards quite uh, close to their uh, their chest. Not sure what their next focus is going to be. I mean, everybody's obviously been focused right now on the immediate uh, need to get uh, the bills that have been introduced, uh, those that, they, that they're focused on getting through, and they have not actually indicated what else they may be tabling or bringing forth. Uh, so uh, how they signal that, well, I think it'll all depend too on you know where we where, where things are sitting come January. So uh, uh, to be frank, I, I'm not 100% sure what the uh, some of the focus is going to be on. Uh, I know uh, we will continue to uh, focus energy on the you know making sure we get a control of the economic situation in this country. I think that's what the government should be focused on is making life more affordable for Canadians. Uh, you know, addressing those key issues that we've already highlighted about labor shortage. Uh, affordable housing and and just getting back to uh, some semblance of normality the best we can here as we move forward. And even as we talk, COVID-19 is, is uh, shadows continuing over this country and uh, we just have to wait and see about that. I've booked my third boost, my third shot, my booster shot. So um, I'm, I'm doing what I can and uh, I'm sure that uh, the house will be um, you know, dealing with those issues as well. Well, actually, a lot of that stuff is falls under provincial mandate, not uh, federal jurisdiction. And to be frank, we haven't debated or discussed any of that. All the uh, measures that have been brought in at the federal level have been done through regulation, not legislation. So there's been no debate or discussion in the House of Commons whatsoever. Uh, you know, the, it hasn't been addressed. It's been done uh, strictly at the purview of the government uh, for the federal jurisdiction issues. But but again, I just look, I encourage Canadians to get out there, get vaccinated. It's one of the most important tools that we can do to reduce transmission and reduce the probability of serious illness or death. So, uh, you know, uh, uh, my, my, both my parents have got their boosters already. I don't qualify yet for another uh, maybe month, but uh, looking forward to getting uh, my booster shot when it's available to me and uh, ultimately it's one tool but we got to figure out how to live with this virus I think it's it's getting to that point now where we have that large percentage of the population uh, that is uh, fully vaccinated uh, and at the same time uh, you know the biggest concern to me is that increased in hospitalizations or ICUs or deaths and in the meantime we should be just uh, you know focused on you know, getting the economy back on under control. We saw one of the statistics that was raised in the House this week alone. Uh, I think it was 6,000 suicides, unfortunately, this past year. The impact of mental health on the mental health that COVID's been ha ha having, we need to do something about that. So, Well, Alex, I want to thank you for the conversations today. I know you've got to run, but uh, it's it's always good to talk to you. I, I trust you will, you will have a, a good Christmas season, but also... You'll be seen around the riding, I'm sure, in, uh, on the break in January. Absolutely, David. Merry Christmas to you, all the viewers out there. Happy New Year. And in behalf of our colleague, uh, my colleague MP, Terry Dedell, who actually has part of Gray County, so I know some of your viewers will uh, be represented by Terry. Uh, Terry bought me lunch today, so I, I just figured I should give a shout out to Terry. Uh, and uh, wish Merry Christmas on behalf of all the residents that and the viewers that are watching. Uh, Merry Christmas, Happy New Year. Thank you, Alex, and thank you, friends. I'm David Sherman. This is Politically Speaking. We'll talk again. Call the Rogers TV viewer response line, email us, or connect with us on social media. Home is your destination for Christmas cheer this season. 